um, to residents and um, providing recreation services to residents and visitors over the next 30 years. Um, and so an important part of that is we are, of course, considering the um, community input on that. So um, that's a really important aspect of this process and everything we're doing is looking for community impact, uh, input. And uh, we also need to consider everything we're doing in the context of the significant growth that's gonna be happening in Minnesville. Um, so this is a long-term plan, it is 30 years. Um, so we need to, to factor that in as well. So our, our progress to date, um, we started with um, a review of background studies. So that was uh, um, one of the first stages and, and we're, you know, that's a part of the process that continues on. Mentioned the online engagement using get involved in .ca. Um, We interviewed council members and staff. There's the random households telephone survey, which went out uh, to, or we, uh, we called 400 people and, uh, and, and received input on that survey. The exact same survey then when was used for the household survey, and that was available online. So if you weren't one of the people that got a telephone call to answer a survey, you could have done it online. We also had three other surveys um, that were focused on different groups. So we had a user group survey, a business survey, and a service club survey. So again, the results of all of that is available on get involved in this field.ca. We just recently met with high school students, uh, one of two meetings. And uh, this is, as I mentioned, the second of our three public information sessions that we're doing. And then of course, we've had ongoing meetings with um, town staff uh, throughout the project and that'll continue towards the, uh, you know, as the project continues. So now we're gonna talk about the land plan and the lake plan and the recommendations uh, that, that are in progress. So for the land plan, we're talking about programming, park facilities, uh, the redevelopment of existing parks, new parks, and then trail improvements and linkages. And so again, the focus of the, tonight is really gonna be about those draft recommendations. Um, and we're gonna speak to you about those uh, in terms of programs and events, facilities, parks, and trails. So I'm gonna turn it over to Leandra and she's gonna run through the draft recommendations on programs and events. Thanks, Mike. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So this assessment is organized by these key service areas. Infant and preschool, children and youth, adults, seniors, arts, culture, and heritage, outdoor activities and events. The following slides will summarize key points from the assessment and draft recommendations for each of those service areas. All recommendations for expanded programming should be done in collaboration with the YMCA and the library. Next slide, please. Okay, so just an overview of the assessment. Providers of programs include the town, YMCA, Idea Lab and Library, sports leagues, community groups, and commercial providers. Of all population age groups, the group 75 plus will see the most growth over the term of the plan, more than doubling in population. From the consultation results, the age groups identified in both online and telephone surveys as most interested in new programs were preschool, children, youth, and adults. The online survey asked what types of programs respondents were most interested in. And the responses were outdoor, water-based, outdoor ice, wellness, events, gymnasium, sports, group fitness, visual arts, social, and environmental programs. Next slide. Overall, there are more options for sport and active programs than for non-sport, including visual arts, social drop-ins, STEAM, general interest. The town collects detailed participation data for all of its programs, which allows for monitoring of actual demand by looking at the fill rate of programs or wait lists, for example. We're in the process of reviewing that data for the past five years. The draft recommendations will be reviewed against the trends in that data and may be revised if necessary. Next slide. Okay, infant and preschool. 
Preschoolers were in the top three age groups, most in need of programs according to the telephone survey. A quick review of participation data suggests that town programs are well attended for this group. The town does not currently have any programming space dedicated to preschool programming. So draft recommendations for this age group are, expand capacity for existing preschool programs by adding more time slots, or making use of additional locations that do not currently host programs, including outdoors. Develop non-sport, additional non-sport programming options for preschoolers, including, for example, parent and child social activities, visual arts, and STEAM. Come to facilities for dedicated preschool programming space. Children and youth. Some of the program types that were most requested in the online and telephone surveys are not well represented in current offerings. Some of those were snow activities, water-based activities aside from swimming, and social club activities for children. Children and youth were in the top three age groups most in need of programs in the telephone and online surveys. Uh, children were selected by 30% in the telephone survey and 31% in the online survey. For youth, they were selected by 28% in the telephone survey. And in the online survey, they were not one of the top groups identified as in need. Despite the reported high interest in programs for these age groups, existing town programs are not filled to capacity. So the assessment will attempt to identify potential reasons for that discrepancy. Continued engagement with youth, such as through Youth Connects and the Youth Engagement Strategy, can help the town provide the right types of programs that teens will attend and participate in. Draft recommendations for this age group, for these two age groups, are develop new programs for children and youth, including a mix of sport and non-sport options and new types of programs that are not currently offered. Scale down programs with historically low enrollment in order to facilitate investment in new program types and the upcoming facilities master plan should consider a location for a games room and or other teen oriented indoor space. This is continuing on. Approach commercial providers of water sports in town, for example, Pride Wake, to discuss opportunities for partnerships, such as an intro to wakeboarding class offered at a lower cost in partnership with the town or try it events on the weekend. And this of course would be suitable for adults also. Adults. Relative to other age groups, adults have many opportunities for organized and self-directed recreation. Adults were also in the top three age groups most in need of programs in the online survey. In reviewing participation data, it appears adult programs are not filled to capacity and the town should focus on increasing participation levels. Draft recommendations for adults are to scale down programs with historically low enrollment in order to facilitate investment in new program types, continue to monitor enrollment and wait lists and add additional programs if needed, and offer new programs as a pilot or try it to gauge interest in new types of activities. So seniors. Seniors can attend programs previously discussed under adults, but this section is concerned with programs specifically geared to seniors, sometimes considered 55 plus or 65 plus. Relative to other age groups, seniors have less recreation opportunities available to them, although they can attend the adult programs of which there are many. The previous 2016 Parks and Recreation Master Plan recommended creating an older adult forum and action plan. And since then the town has implemented a senior programming committee. Consultations with seniors in the 2016 plan indicated interest in dancing, yoga, lawn bowling, and chair exercises. Since then, all of these activities have been implemented with the exception of lawn bowling. Reported interest in additional programs for seniors was low in both the online and telephone surveys. However, the growth expected in this age group, with the growth expected, uh, programming, including drop-in social activities, should be expanded. Draft recommendations are, the upcoming facilities master plan should assess options for dedicated social and programming space for seniors within other facilities. Develop new programs for seniors. Program types should include a mix of active and non-active options. 
and continue to work with the senior programming committee to keep up to date on evolving seniors needs and interests. Arts, culture and heritage. These programs and activities are provided by the town, ideal lab and library and a number of community organizations and businesses. The town offers a few visual art programs for children and one for adults. The town also offers a wide variety of dance classes for all ages. Participation appears to be higher for preschool and children and lower for adult and senior classes. Strong interest was reported in the online survey, survey particularly for visual arts with, at 43%. In reviewing the arts and culture programming options in town, there are fewer options for visual arts and drama as compared to dance. Providing arts and culture programs also advances the actions recommended in the Innisfil Culture Master Plan. Draft recommendations are to expand the introductory level arts and culture programming, particularly visual arts for all ages. The upcoming facilities master plan should assess options for visual arts studio space in town facilities. Outdoor activities. The town offers some classes outdoors and moved many programs outdoors due to COVID. They also began permitting open spaces for fitness and wellness classes. Other organized outdoor activities are provided by community clubs and organizations like sport leagues, garden clubs, snowmobile clubs. And residents can also partake in self-directed outdoor recreation at parks, trails, waterfronts, facilities, and their own private land. When asked in the online programs, residents were most in participating in activities did the selections. Outdoor snow activities, 61%, water-based activities, 60%, and outdoor ice activities, 53%, were the top chosen. Environmental programs were one of the most selected for non-sport activities, with 39%. With the appropriate facilities and amenities, many programs can be conducted outdoors if participants are willing. Comfort amenities like change rooms and uh, warming huts, pavilions, etc help encourage those who are deter deterred by cold or wet weather. Draft recommendations are that where it has been successful during COVID, continue offering existing programs outdoors. Develop new outdoor programs year round, like cross country skiing, snowshoeing, winter survival class, et cetera, and work with the marketing and communications to help foster a positive view of outdoor recreation in all weather. Events. The major providers of special events in Innisfil are the Town of Innisfil, Innisfil Rotary Club, and the Innisfil Community Events Corporation, also known as Ice Corp. The town organizes events that are geared to local communities, such as Neighborhood Nights, Christmas and New Year Skates, and Innisfil Spirit of the Community. And other providers, like Innisfil Ice, provide events for the community that also draw visitors, like Innisfil's Got Talent. Resident consultations indicated a strong interest in more events. In the telephone survey, the majority of residents were in support of having more events, 82%, and more major commercial events to attract visitors and tourists, 78%. In the online survey, one day and weekend special events was the second most selected non-sport activity of interest with 50%. There are a variety of major annual festivals held in the area, most of which focus on music. So potential new visitor attractive events in Innisfil should be focused on themes and seasons that are not currently addressed. The program delivery assessment will consider how responsibilities for different types of events should be allocated within the town and between other providers. Draft recommendations are to support community organizers to offer more large scale visitor attractive events continue to provide municipal events for local communities and designate an events coordinator who would be responsible for both town events and facilitating support for non-municipal event organizers. Okay, so now we have a Slido question. We would like to know, do you or your family attend town programs and events? And if not, why not?
All right. Okay, I think that's probably everybody. Uh, thank you. That's that's helpful. Timing will be something um, I mentioned previously that we're going to look at. You know, reasons that participation could be increased. So we'll look into timing as something to investigate. Ah, we still got some movement. Location. Not interested. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it over to Mary Catherine now, who will take you through facilities. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to do uh, facilities for organized activity, which include tennis courts, pickleball courts, ball diamonds, and sports fields. The parks section deals with other types of facilities for self-directed activity. So that will be, th those will be spoken about a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of where we started uh, to assess need, we looked at um, the fact that there's no organized tennis or pickleball in Innisfil currently. And organized activity largely comprises ball and soccer. And for all facilities, existing supply in terms of numbers per numbers of facilities per 1,000 population, which is a typical provision level comparison, is um, is relatively low compared to other communities. Next slide, Mike, please. Um, but we're using we're we're basing our supply calculations on pre-COVID uh, use. And it indicates that facilities are not used to capacity and um, making relatively low, lower supply rates appropriate. So we look at use in terms of determining what the appropriate supply level is for, uh, to meet demand. And there's also limited unmet demand for access to facility. And our underlying objective in, in assessment is to this direction to make Innisfil a place versus a space. So to provide locally, um, local municipal facilities so that people can recreate uh, in organized sports at home, don't necessarily have to go elsewhere to do that. So, and the population we are, we are uh, working towards is 2051. So it's a 30 year time frame, And uh, the current population is 47,500 roughly. And we're looking at a population of 96,300, roughly in 1951. So, and that aligns with the transportation master plan um, population projections that, it, that are being used uh, in that planning exercise. Uh, next slide, please. So draft recommendations for tennis and pickleball, there's a, an existing total of seven dual use courts in, in this bill. And the 2016, master plan uh, provided a provision ratio of one for 5,000 people. Um, and we feel that is reasonable for planning purposes at this point. Uh, there is no actual use data on the courts because they are casual use. So part of the um, need going forward is to, is to be able to um, monitor the actual use of courts and then adjust the planning uh, supply ratio as required. So that's essentially something that will have to be done for all facilities. So we want to, we want to know exactly what's happening on those facilities to confirm the long-term need for um, additional uh, courts. And with trends changing, that, that may need adjustment. So based on this one to 5,000, we projected need to 2051, totals 19 or 12 more than is, it, is available in the current supply. Now, as part of the um, overall recommendations, we are recommending that the four courts at Innisville Beach Park be dedicated to for organized tennis activity. So they become um, single purpose for tennis. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. And that of the additional 12 to be developed, four are also developed in a single location for organized pickleball. So there would be two, one for pickle, one location for pickleball and one location for tennis. 
and the remaining eight courts out of the additional 12 should be dual purpose for casual use for both tennis and pickleball. And they would be, um, we haven't actually looked yet at, in, at locations, but presumably they will be dispersed throughout the community to uh, prove, to provide reasonable access for people in different uh, neighborhoods. And again, monitoring actual use of the courts for both types of activity will be required to confirm uh, and adjust the provision levels by type if required. Uh, next slide, Mike. So ball diamonds, current population based provision ratio is one lit diamond for every 13,500 people roughly, and one end lit for every 17,600 people approximately. <clears throat> so using these, um, supply levels and projecting to 2051. We're looking at three new lit diamonds and one new unlit diamond to serve the population to 96,000. And that is based on population growth only. Should activity levels change within the sport, then they would um, be adjusted upwards or downwards based on monitoring actual use and they would be updated uh, in the five-year updates to the master plan. Uh, next slide, please. Sports fields. Um, now we've, currently sports fields are classed as soccer fields, but we're looking at a broader level of use for sports fields and uh, so that we will be able to accommodate different types of sports on fields. Um, other, interests have emerged and are emerging. So we wanna make sure that we're able to capture that use and provide and serve those, uh, those interests. So the current population-based provision ratio for sports fields is one lit field for every 18,300 people roughly and one unlit for every 19,800 people. And based on this provision ratio, when we look to 2051, we're looking at two new lit fields and no new unlit fields. Again, that's to serve population growth with the proviso that actual use is monitored and provision levels are updated. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, today the, those towns fields have been used almost exclusively for soccer and there are other, other sports that could potentially use the fields and the municipality should really proactively support other sports fields. Users such as lacrosse, football, rugby, field hockey, ultimate frisbee. A lot of the uh, provincial organizations have, are making concerted efforts to develop uh, introductory level programming for these sports. So we would anticipate more demand to materialize in the future, which would translate into uh, use of, the, of fields. And um, some municipalities are uh, looking more towards artificial fields because they can provide different sports access to high facilities then seasonally and, uh, during the day while limiting uh, consumption of available parkland. Now, this is something that the municipality would um, was recommended in the 2016 master plan that the town look at a cost benefit uh, study for the provision of uh, an artificial turf field. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Oh, okay. Now we're at our um, slido.com question. And as, um, as Leandra said, we have more work to do on these in terms of refining the, the um, recommendations and uh, looking for locations to ensure that the community is well served geographically. So again, these are just draft high level and uh, there's more, there's a lot more to be provided in our report. Um, now thinking about organized recreation, so not necessarily um, facilities you would go to parks for, for uh, casual use. Do you think there are other outdoor facilities needed to uh, provide Innisfil residents with uh, programs or activities. Just write them down. And um, I think it should come up as a word cloud. We'll see. And hopefully you can put more than one answer down. So if you've got. Yeah, if you have more than one, one, one thought, uh, add it.
we'll give it a couple more, maybe one more minute just to give people a chance to think. So we will be recording all of these. Um, we have access to, of course, the results afterwards. And so this will be an important part of the, you know, the, the process and getting the feedback, so. So this is great. Yes, this is also showing some programs as well as uh, other things. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the point of a word cloud too is if you see something that somebody else wrote and if you write it as well, then it gets bigger. So don't feel because somebody else gave the answer that you were going to give that you shouldn't write it down. So that's why outdoor Tai Chi is much larger because there's at least two people that wrote that down. Okay, maybe 10 more seconds and then we'll, we'll move on to parks. Okay, well, thank you very much. This is good, thanks. So parks, um, the goal with parks, um, you know, one of the, the main goals is to provide a sufficient supply of park spaces for everybody. So that's uh, one of the, the key items we're looking at based on, you know, where people live and the future population. Uh, we also wanna make sure, sure that existing parks are, um, you know, upgraded as needed, well-maintained, um, they are accessible, safe, comfortable, connected, and enjoyable. So um, that's part of our assessment work that we're doing. We're looking at all those existing parks. And then we want to provide a framework for increasing the accessibility and quality of the ex of existing and new parks. Um, so over the life of the plan, there's a you know, direction given on how to, uh, to keep them, um, you know, in meeting the needs of the public. Is there a way, since we've added some people as since we've started the meeting, are we able to go back to um, just the Slido? Um, this the QR a, code? Well, what QR I'll do, look, I'll go back to this one here. So yeah, okay, so if, okay. you're, if you're late to start, what these slides are, uh, they're polling questions. And so that QR code there on the left, if you use your smartphone or your tablet, use the camera, um, put it over the QR code. Very similar, I guess, if you were dining out with menus, you know, digital menus. Same idea, that should bring up slido.com. If you can't get on using your, your camera, you can just go to the website slido.com, enter that code 862788. And then as we go through these polling questions, um, for example, this one here that's up on your screen, you should be able to answer this polling question and uh, your, your answers will be recorded. We'll be using this. Uh, for reference afterwards. So we have a couple of more questions coming up that we'll uh, we'd be interested in getting your feedback. Uh, three more actually. So um, if you don't have your smartphone or tablet handy, go grab it and, uh, and this will allow you to uh, participate in these polls. Mike, can people go back and do the, the ones that have already um, been, been posted? Can, like... I don't know the answer to that question actually. I think normally the QR code takes them to all the questions we ask, so okay. it should work. Yeah, so if you can and you think of something afterwards, feel free to, to jump on there afterwards and, and answer your question. Um, yeah, so we did that. So the objectives of the parks um, plan are to upgrade parks to standards and uh, and want to address accessibility health and, and provide residents in every neighborhood with access to parks within a reasonable distance. We want to make sure they're located geographically and in places that make sense to give residents you know, um, easy access to their parks. Um, we are reviewing and providing feedback for planned undeveloped parks. There is, of course, a lot of development planned for Innisfil, and that will be, and those park spaces will be uh, considered in this plan. And then exploring opportunities to provide new types of parks and amenities. So, um, you know, playgrounds, splash pads, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we'll be looking at all of those in these new parks and where they're appropriate. Um, 
one thing that these plans often do is categorize parks. And this helps us understand um, what amenities make sense for the different categories. Um, so not all parks are the same. Certain parks are to address different levels of use, types of use, and, uh, you know, um, what, you know that, that'll help us figure out what improvements need to be made on different parks. So we are looking through those categories right now, and we're adjusting the description or criteria for those categories. And I have a table I'll show you in a moment as a work in progress. Um, we are removing the size as a defining criteria for uh, the different parks, just because we were finding that that wasn't really working for Innisfil. So um, we removed that. We are adding um, an idea of the service area that, you know, so if a park, based on the type of park, what area they were, what's the extent of the community that's to be, uh, that uh, park is to serve. So, um, you know, is it a neighborhood park? Is it just for, um, you know, more local community or is it a regional larger park that's going to draw people from around, all around in this fill? Uh, we've made a couple of category changes or we're, we're rec recommending them at this point. One of them is to remove parkette as a classification. This was for the, the smallest of the classifications. Um, however, there did seem to be inconsistencies with it always being a small park size. So instead we've changed all smaller parks or all ones that were labeled as parkettes and made them neighborhood parks, which is an existing category already. And then there was a new category that was added um, in the previous plan, but there is yet to be a park um, that's actually um, assigned this category and that's the linear park category. Um, and so we think we know what that, the purpose of that um, category possibly was, but instead we've added a new category, which is the natural area greenway category, which would address um, linear um, trails, um, connections and also nat natural environment considerations. And so I'll show you a table in a moment. The last one I skipped over there was lakeside parks. These were known before as road ends and we were renaming them as, as lakeside parks. Um, and so this would be a new category. So as those, those road ends um, are upgraded and improved, they could then become a lakeside park designation and become a full-fledged park. So that would happen over time as the, those road ends are improved, or as I'm saying now called lakeside parks. So this table here shows you the different categories. Um, and so some of them we, we are not changing, but so there's neighborhood park um, as the type of park that is focusing on neighborhoods, as you would expect, um, having both active and passive opportunities. Um, the lakeside parks, so these would be, you know, the ends of roads along the lake and again, as road ends are um, converted and, and developed into actual parks, they would be designated as lakeside parks. We have the community district parks. So these would serve the, the broader, larger community and would have more of a focus on um, active sports fields and um, higher uh, you know, amenities. Regional park, again, much larger service area and, and more uh, substantial amenities. The special use category, um, so that um, has a, for parks that don't really fit into those other categories, might have a, a unique cultural heritage or, or natural landscape um, aspect to them. And then the, the other new category that we're introducing is a natural area greenway. So that's looking at natural areas, um, protection of land, wildlife habitat, flood management, that sort of thing. Um, so that would provide an opportunity for passive enjoyment of of the environment and would also be a key part of um, the trails um, network that I'm going to talk about um, in the next section. Um, so we're looking, of course, at parks um, to 2051. Again, this is a 30 year plan. So um, a few facts in, ter in terms of what we've found so far. So based on current park supply, um, there is a surplus in the regional park category. Um, however, additional neighborhood parks and community district parks will be required to meet future needs. Um, some of this will be provided um, through the future developments. So when, when a new community is developed and parks are provided, that'll help offset some of that need, but eventually additional parks will be necessary. 
And by 2051, we estimate at this point that approximately 30.9 hectares of neighborhood parks, uh, neighborhood park, and 33.96 hectares of district parks will be uh, found. We've uh, been looking specifically on you know, where some of those um, deficiencies might lie. So um, some of those areas that are currently deficient, uh, Sandy Cove, especially west and south, Alcona in the northeast and southwest, Churchill, south of Killarney Beach Road, and Guilford, especially in the west and south. So those are areas that are currently deficient. Um, and again, some of those proposed parks and the future developments will address some of those gaps, um, but we'll, we'll be looking further into that to see what needs to be, you know, happen for that 30 year timeline. Um, in terms of community district parks, uh, new parks are required in Alcona, Churchill and Guilford. And now a few slides on existing parks and um, upgrades that may be required. So things we're looking at to recommend, um, and we'll be providing more specifics in, on this when we have the draft master plan, and there will be an opportunity to review that, but uh, things like tree planting and naturalized planting, uh, additional seating and picnic tables, shade structures, um, newer upgraded pathways, especially when to achieve accessibility standards, um, possibly lighting, providing connections to the existing or future trail network and wayfinding and interpretive signage. So those are possible upgrades that may be happening uh, to existing parks. Um, so when, for example, some Centennial Park that we've been looking at, um, updated dog park, trail signage, um, adding a disc golf course, um, providing interpretive signage, and then enhancing the pond and creek edge with native planting. So that's an example of upgrades that may, uh, may be recommended for Centennial Park. Um, to take it a step further, if, if we're talking about minor improvements, so this is where we're we'll be recommending upgrades to one or two existing infrastructure elements. So this is things like play equipment and playground safety surfacing, uh, perhaps a skate park, um, introduction of a, a parking lot, and things like multi-use courts. Those would be a sort of a minor improvement. And then uh, in addition to that, of course, any of those park upgrades I just mentioned would apply as well, potentially. So one example is Anna Maria Park. So this is where we'd be looking at an updated playground and uh, playground safety surfacing. Um, adding a shade structure, seating, or a picnic area, uh, adding a multi-sport court, or perhaps and perhaps lighting, and tree naturalization plantings to remove invasive species. And then major improvements, so things like new washroom or change room facilities. Um, if there was upgrades to three or more existing infrastructure elements, such as a playground, skate park, parking lot multi-use court, we would consider that a major improvement. Um, adding uh, new infrastructure elements, such as, you know, maybe there's not a play equipment there now or a new uh, expanded playground, um, skate park, parking lot or multi-use courts. And then any of those other improvements that I've mentioned on the previous slides, um, they would also be, could be part of those park improvements for, we consider major improvements. Um, of course, Innisfil Beach Park has its own master plan. So um, a lot of that is considered, would be considered a major improvement. And some of those have already taken place. So uh, the BMX pump track and the outdoor fitness obstacle course are examples of, of major improvements that have already taken, taken place. Another example um, that we're looking at is Churchill Park. So for this park, we might be considering updating uh, the playground and surfacing and pathways adding a shade structure, um, adding tennis or pickleball courts, washing facilities, maybe additional parking and uh, tree and naturalization planting or the removal of invasive species. So that was pertaining to existing parks. We're also of course looking at those undeveloped neighborhood parks. Um, so we would be looking at developing them recommend, recommendations based on providing both passive and active spaces um, providing some infrastructure such as play equipment, skate park, splash pad, multi-use courts, shading and seating, uh, picnic areas, perhaps play equipment, 
uh, maybe a washroom or change room facilities, and then any other opportunities that may may arise. So, um, so we're not we're not just limited to these ones that we're we're listing here. Similarly, with uh, the larger community district parks, um, these would likely be mostly active spaces, spaces um, providing uh, at least two infrastructure elements. So again, things like play equipment, skate parks, splash pad, multi-use courts, washroom, change room facilities, seating, picnic areas, and, uh, and, and other uh, improvements. So that brings us to our Slido question. So what do you see as being the most important improvement to your local park? So um, give this a moment and see if there's anything that you feel needs to be improved uh, for whatever park you feel is, uh, you know, you consider your local park. And again, we will be providing more detail on specific recommendations to all the parks um, as part of the draft plan when that's available um, in, later in the spring. So um, at that point, you'll be able to see exactly you know, what, what's being recommended for a specific park and provide feedback at that time. Okay, let's give it a, a 10 more seconds and then we'll move on to trails. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on trails, we are, we've got, I've got two slides on trails. So first off, I just wanna talk about the strategy that we're approaching, uh, um, looking at a trail strategy for, for Innisfil. And the first point being that we're, we are coordinating this with the transportation master plan. So, um, which is an important aspect of it. So they're looking mostly on on-road um, connections um, or things like sidewalks and that sort of thing. And uh, we, are, we are looking to connect into his existing on and off road trail network um, as it was proposed in the 2016 active in trails master plan. So we're, we're advancing that work. Um, and then we're, we're trying to take it a step further by looking at the existing natural heritage system, um, open space system, and look at existing rights of ways and that sort of thing. And trying to really have a, a connected system of trails throughout uh, the town. And this is where that natural area greenway category comes in. So where appropriate, we're, um, we're hoping to designate uh, trails along areas that might be um, you know, natural areas that aren't suitable for development, um, need some protection. And if we can sensitively, sensitively do so, we'll introduce trails to these areas and use that as part of the network to, uh, um, to connect uh, different locations throughout in this bill. So we are going to provide a conceptual network of trails um, throughout the town. And this plan will be used uh, for future planning and the design of new community developments. So there'll be an understanding um, ahead of time of where this trail network would ideally go. And then these new developments can ideally uh, incorporate these trail networks into them. Um, we're looking at, as a, looking at it as a town-wide trail network um, to connect settlement areas and uh, and improve waterfront access so we're we want to make sure these trails you know connect places that are meaningful to one to to the community that are important destinations and then provide another um you know way of getting from place to place um one of the recommendations we're looking at is providing a waterfront trail linking um lakeside parks within Innisfil. so this would be mostly an on-road route or assigned uh, route but then also looking if we can expand that around uh, Lake Simcoe. So this would be looking at a strategy to help work with the neighboring municipalities that are all around Lake Simcoe and how there could actually be a signed trail route um, to take you around the lake. 
Um, we're also working with the transportation master plan to make sure that all the trails that are recommended and everything is linked together um, between this master plan and the transportation master plan that we're working on. Yes, exactly. Um, we are, uh, so this trail system would support new recreation and active transportation opportunities. Um, so that would be again tied to that, um, to that other plan that's happening. And then the last point there being um, identifying property that may be um, required to for acquisition, or it could be um, could be easements, or um, you know there's all the different types of mechanisms where you can get access to private property, or could be purchased for town town use. So this is going to be a long term strategy again. 30 years out. And uh, so the idea is that you have this plan in place for future, uh, future implementation. So this is our, uh, our next slide question. So where would you like to see new trails and what kind of trails? I believe you can pick as many as you, you like. I suspect that one's like all <laughs> more trails. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I said I said the forested trail. I think I was the one that suggest that one. I love. I love. I love walking in a, a forested trail. And I used to cycle a lot more too, but I'm getting a little lazy as I get older. <laughs> And this feels pretty flat and easy to cycle around in this one. Okay, we'll give it a few more, a few more seconds and we'll move on to the lake plan. I appreciate everybody sticking with us because I know this is a lot of information to go through. And then we can open it up for questions. Okay, seeing no move, more movement on the table, we're gonna move on to lake plan. So. Um, oh, just like the uh, land plan, uh, the updated plan, and the year plan, and we're focused on improving access and enjoyment of Innisfield's waterfront. So um, we're looking at improvements to lakeside parks, which um, were previously referred to as road ends and, uh, and other waterfront facilities. We're trying to um, look at opportunities or trying to encourage year round programming and, and make sure that's addressed through the design. Um, we're, we're looking at assessing the need, interest and market for a municipal marina and or town operated docks or moorings. And uh, I'll talk about more about that in a moment. And then finally consider opportunities to attract waterfront based commercial uses. Um, so the, there are 48 road ends or lakeside parks as we're referring to them. Um, so there's quite a few and they really do have a, there's a wide range of them in terms of size, uh, how they can be accessed, how they're used now and the amenities that, that are provided. So there's everything from, you know, what many of you probably um, would consider as an actual park and it may actually be designated a park. And then there are other ones that um, are totally hidden and unknown and, uh, for those to actually become a park, quite a bit of work would need to happen. As now we the, see, you know, and as we see climate change too, some of these will also be very vital, a lot of them, um, if not very specific to drainage improvements. So the, all of these will have, you know, likely a drainage aspect to them. So mm -hmm. as I look out my window and see the flooding that I'm a bit worried about. <laughs> um, so, so recently, of course, the town has um, done some upgrades to three um, lakeside parks. So they were at Guilford Road, Shore Acres Drive, and Ninth Line. So these are great precedents, and we, we've learned a lot from these. So what's worked, uh, where improvements could be made. And uh, so, so it's uh, the program we're talking about is, is improving on that and building on that for, uh, for the other uh, road ends. And so the plan that's going to be provided will provide direction on those future improvements, whether it is just for, as Meredith said, drainage improvements, or it's uh, more advanced into to basically make it a, a park um, that'll all be uh, outlined. 
So these next few slides, just to give you an idea of just where these road ends are. And um, so you can always go look up this presentation afterwards if you want to get a, a better look at it. But there are 48 of them. Um, and uh, so the first one, starting at the north end, Big Bay Point and Sandy Cove, there are 11 road ends there. Um, Alcona has seven. See there at the bottom of the bottom right hand side. Big Cedar Point. There are nine lake access lakeside park. Uh, Lafroy, it's quite a few, 13. And then Guilford has eight. So we've been uh, assessing all of these and some of the key considerations that we've been you know, taking notes on and, and uh, it will help address the improvements needed. We're looking at water access. Um, you know, how do you get from the road to the water? Um, we need to have an understanding, is it, is it accessible? Um, what improvements need to be made? Parking, of course, is always an issue. Um, so we've looked at what the opportunities for parking are, whether it's on street or on site. Environmental considerations, we do have a, our environmental consultant on our team who's been looking at these, um, all of these lakeside parks and, and what the potential is for, for improving, uh, whether it's invasive species or naturalization. Uh, drainage uh, improvements, as Meredith mentioned, a lot of these are very important from a drainage aspect. and so. That's a, a key consideration to make sure that we're not impeding drainage and ideally um, any improvements made uh, to these sites will uh, improve the, uh, the drainage um, for the surrounding area. Winter access is important for many of these, especially from a, an ice fishing standpoint. Privacy on some of the smaller ones we understand is an issue, the proximity of residents to uh, existing you know, homes to these uh, lakeside parks. And then looking at user impacts. So, um, you know, how are they used now? What are, what are the impacts of, of users on these uh, on these sites going forward? Um, we've also looked at you know the current uses in terms of um, ones that are being used as a formal boat launch versus informal boat launches. Uh, many, of course, are great uh, have great beaches or provide swimming access. And then ice fishing um, is a big part for some of these. Uh, uh, lakeside parks, it's a, it's a way that ice fishers um, get access to the lake. Um, so in terms of our draft recommendations, so um, we've, we're looking at categorizing those lakeside parks. So just like we are on the land plan side, uh, we can categorize the lakeside parks into different um, levels of service. Uh, that'll help us inform us uh, what type of improvements need to be made. So and things like improved access, um, new amenities that need to be provided, beach enhancements, naturalization and shoreline enhancements, and programming improvements are all, uh, are all important considerations in these recommendations. So a bit more on it, the, the access aspect of these uh, lakeside parks. So um, where possible, we'd be looking at installing pathway from the road to the water, safe access route for all types of um, potentially looking at pay parking is appropriate. Um, so this would be you know, for the most part on, on the larger road ends, um, designated resident parking uh, as appropriate, um, providing barrier free access when possible, uh, which on some of these is, is, uh, would be a challenge just because of the existing topography and the, the slope that going from the road to the water providing swing gates to permit emergency and maintenance access and uh, providing a clear path to the lake to permit winter access for ice fishing. In terms of amenities, um, the provision of amenities will be based on the categorization um, that, will, that will be developed, um, the existing features that may exist on the site and uh, um, we'll be proposing designs for each of the lakeside parks. Uh, but at a minimum, we see most of those lakeside parks will have some seating, shade, signage, litter receptacles, and bicycle parking. Lighting uh, will be determined on a site-by-site -site basis. So some, some of the larger road ends make sense to have some lightings, other ones that are, um, would, would not be considered. And then if there's opportunities for things like boat launches, lookouts, platforms, uh, will also be considered where appropriate. 
um, for the lakeside parks that have um, beaches and good water access, we may be recommending expanding a beach area, uh, or perhaps it's just importing or installing new sand. Um, there might be an opportunity to install some swimming buoys and then just improving access again from, from the road down to the water. Um, in terms of park naturalization and shoreline enhancements, there's all uh, types of things that may happen on these. So it may be include bioswales to collect, polish, and filter runoff, um, removal of non-native or invasive species, perhaps habitat creation, uh, bioengineering to improve stabilized eroding banks, uh, shoreline stabilization with boulders and native planting, and then maybe just simply planting uh, to stabilize ex of exposed soils. Uh, on, uh, on different portions of, a, of, a, of the uh, site. Uh, programming. So many uh, road ends, of course, do have beach access and swimming. So we'd be looking to uh, potentially encourage that or, or make sure that it continues in a, in a safe, uh, safe manner. Uh, launch space for and amenities for canoes, kayaks, and stand-up paddle boards. Um, some of the road ends might, uh, might be suitable for that. Uh, designating certain lakeside parks for fishing and then ice fishing access. Um, we want to make sure we that is still permitted or a, a possible on, uh, on particular road ends. Um, as I mentioned on an earlier slide, so we, we are looking at different marine opportunities, whether it's boat slips, mooring, uh, or you know, opportunities or boat launches. So we, we've done quite a bit of work on that with our um, our marina, our, our shoreline engineers, and our uh, marine expert. Um, but we do need further analysis and study on that. So that will be ready as part of the recommendations uh, in the draft master plan. So we're not ready to share anything there yet. There's more work needs to be done, but that will be coming shortly. So this is our last Slido question, is what amenities or improvements would you like to see at the lakeside parks? So perhaps there's things that I haven't mentioned that you think should be, you can mention that, or if you just want to emphasize something that I've already you know, mentioned in one of the previous slides, that's, uh, that's fine too. So I just have a couple more slides after this, and then we can, uh, we'll open it up for questions. And again, this is a word cloud. So if you agree with some, what somebody has written, feel free to type it in um, as well, and it'll uh, increase the size of the the uh, of the word just to emphasize, um, you know, that there's more than one person that's interested in that. I'll give it about 10 more seconds and then I'll, I'll wrap up the presentation portion. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. So feedback opportunities. So as I've mentioned a few times, get involved in isfield.ca is the place to go if you uh, wish to provide any feedback on any aspect of the project. Um, the draft master plan, when it's ready, will be posted on uh, get involved in and, uh, and then public information session number three, um, that's where we'll be presenting the draft master plan and uh, there'll be an opportunity for, uh, to provide feedback at that session or through the other channels that, uh, you know, that I've already mentioned. Next Sweet. step after this. Uh, next. Sorry. Um, next steps, uh, we're gonna review and assess all the feedback that we receive um, refine uh, and detailing of the cost recommendations. Uh, and so that'll include um, a, a timeline 
uh, for, for implementing. Um, we're gonna be des preparing designs for specific parks and then developing plans for each lakeside park to articulate the recommendations. So um, that'll be used again for implementing in the future. So there's an understanding of what the recommendations look like for, for each park. And uh, so all that will go into that draft master plan uh, report, which will be available for review and comment. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so if you have a question, you can use the, uh, the chat on, on Zoom. And the question I guess will be read out and we'll, the team will uh, answer it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so we do, we do have a few questions and some of them came in through the Slido. Um, so, uh, and I probably can answer some of these for you uh, too. So I won't put you all on the spot here, Mike, but um, one of the questions is, um, uh, you know, what does Innisfil ask developers for park space, cash and loo, or ask for specific features to be built in greenfield subdivisions? It's required, um, just curious. So yes, in development areas, there is a, it's a calculation. I think it's about 5% of the development that we get in parkland and yes, um, there is uh, sometimes cash and loo. Uh, I also agree that we want to get as much park space as we can. So uh, we do that. Uh, we work with the developers um, and uh, usually the parks come to the town and we get to develop them. Um, how can council take a stronger stand to not take cash in lieu of park land to meet future demands? So um, yes, well, we are working on that. Um, we Number one first is the parkland. So we uh, we try to fall back in line. Um, so the question was, I think we answered this one is how does the trails in this plan align with the active transportation and the transportation master plan? So we are lining those two master plans. All the recommendations for the road um, trails um, will connect with the off-road trails that uh, were in this as well. Um, is walkability to some of these activities considered when planning events? Is there any background work related to demographics in particular areas? So I may throw that one at think. Yeah, um, well, we definitely look at the distribution of parks and we want to make sure things are evenly distributed so that um, things are walkable as much as possible. So, um, so we, we consider from that point of view, um, in terms of demographics for specific um, communities, I'm not sure we have that level of detail. So I guess maybe that's partially where we're going to be relying on community feedback um, so we can understand that if there is a, a particular need in a specific location, that we can, we can address that. But uh, we do look demographics uh, town-wide and you know, any additional information that's provided, we will certainly take that in consideration. Great, thank you. Um, please explain what you mean by park redevelopment. Does this mean, for example, possibly taking away um, baseball diamonds at Innisfil Beach Park? I've heard this. So redevelopment on a whole scale just means making improvements to the park, um, to parks. So um, maybe the park just has, you know, a bench and a playground and we wanna add some more amenities to it. Um, we wanna add plantings. So it's not really specific. It is meaning that we could make different enhancements and changes to the park. Um, particularly at Innisfil Beach Park that's being worked out through the, um, the master plan for the plans for the Innisfil Beach Park, which was a separate master plan from this one. Um, Lakeside Parks, what would prohibit boat launchers at these locations? Maybe a mic, how are we adjust, sure. how are we dealing with that one? Well, I guess we would, obviously there's, all kinds of like design work that we can do. So if there was an issue, sounds like you're asking how do we stop boat launching at a certain location. Through the design, there probably would be some sort of gate that would prevent that uh, if that's an issue on a particular location. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these boat launch, or a lot of these lakeside parks, um, lake access parks, um, really probably boat launching isn't even gonna be feasible. So it's a really a case by case basis. Um, but if there are certain locations that we should be um, that are, it is an issue, then we should, we'll hopefully be, we're aware of that and we can uh, address it through the design. Yeah, and we'll be also focusing the design for certain spots to focus on boat launching. Exactly. So I think one of the things in the strategy that we're looking at 
there's 48 of these parks. So we want to make sure that there's a real understanding of which one, which, which parks are, you know, good for boat launching, which ones are good for kayaking um, and small craft launching, which ones have great beaches. Um, you know, there's that, all that sort of information that needs to be um, disseminated to the community. So there's an understanding of what uses are appropriate in, in certain parks. So we're, we're going to try to spread it out across the community um, based on, um, you know, need, but also on what's appropriate for that site. And to further add to the cash and loop question earlier, sorry, um, if we do receive cash and loop for any parkland, it also allows us to make even better parks. So um, more desirable parks in certain areas. So um, it's, it's always a, it, either or, um, it's all for parks. So um, sorry. Is there thoughts on improving pedestrian and cycling safety on Big Bay near Friday Harbor within the trail plan? So I know that there's a there is uh, recommendations for the 25th off-road multi-use trail that that's being worked on, and so you know as a whole, not just specific to Big Bay, but we'll be looking at improvements on on through the master through the through the um, transportation master plan, as well as this master plan on and improvements to trails as a whole. Will road access parts have ways to prevent um, boat, boating activities close by? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah. Uh, will road access parks have ways to prevent boating activities close by? Um, well, that's a good good point. We haven't got to that level of detail, but if it's a, I think we mentioned swimming boys. So if if there is a concern that there's swimming and we don't want to have conflicts with, with boaters. And that's something we can certainly look at. I and mean, we have heard that in a certain, certain locations. So um, yes, I guess we will we'll definitely look at that as a, as a possible introduction. I don't, it wouldn't be something that would probably be at every uh, location, but certain ones, yes. Um, I think I can answer this one. But is there a plan to increase natural coverage to better meet the recommended, recommended target of 40% natural coverage natural coverage in Lake Simcoe watershed, we are at 28%. So we are working on that. There is EP lands with development um, and the natural, um, sorry, Mike, what's the uh, designation, the new designation that we have? Uh, the natural, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, any of the EP yeah. lands are also, there's, there's a lot of existing lands that the part that town already owns that's, you know, environmentally protected. And so the only, you know, additions that we would put in those spaces is maybe some trail systems, um, but those will continue to be protected. And we'll be looking to further um, protect as we can it through, through, through development. Uh, And we've got a good question about, I'm sure you've reached out looking for volunteers to run program. Someone may respond um, for pickleball. Uh, so provide the tools to vol for the volunteers to run programs. So that's a good point. So, you know, there's a volunteer opportunities that we can maybe look at through this plan for, for, those, for those groups. I was trying to see. Natural areas. Yes. So another point about natural areas, uh, greenways, our plan needs to start now. Um, building on the natural uh, trails, we have um, new development in adjacent areas with respect to the plan um, for their lands if this is going to work. Um, the plan is describing maybe would be a little bit too, a little too late. I think, I think that's all the questions I've got. Kara, have you received any additional questions? No, nothing else. Great. And then, so the, the, then there's the other comment about trying to not just protect what we have, um, but try to increase our natural coverage, so. Thank you. We'll be looking into that as well. So unless 
there is any further questions. And feel free, um, my email is mgoodwin at innisfil.ca. Uh, so feel free to, uh, if you have further questions, uh, to email me myself um, and we'll pass it on to the team. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll be back again uh, with more recommendations and the draft master plan. So we really appreciate your time tonight and thank you so much and have a great evening and stay dry or if you have snow or rain outside. <laughs> All right, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.